Question one. Will God do it that sanctify us once? The answer as a one-time experience with salvation? The lengthy debate concluded with a strong yes. We can't do it ourselves. There's no man who can starve himself and fast and pray and wear white gongs and transfer life into a sanctified life on his own. Can't do it. Because Jesus did it for us. It's a gift. It's done. It's completed. Is it a one-time experience with salvation? No. But it's a done deal. It's, it's a second experience. However, since it is not the same as salvation, and it's a second experience, which... Often it's evidence with tongues, but not exclusively. Let me give you an example of that statement. My oldest brother, Herb, he was a very strong gospel hall man. And then he had a Pentecostal exposure. And he was determined to bring the gospel hall into Pentecost. He worked all his life at it. And in order to do that, the one part of Pentecost that he denied himself and he excluded was glossolalia, tongues. He just didn't see the reality in that. It just didn't make sense to him. And so he plodded on in his Pentecostal walk with the Lord, always trying to win the gospel hall back to Pentecost. Until one day, a guest speaker came to the church in Sudbury, where he attended. And there was an altar call. And during the service, he started to have this terrible pain in his throat and a hoarseness that Eventually, he's as though he couldn't speak, and it was very, according to him, uncomfortable. So he thought, well, I'll go up for prayer and see what happens. <laughs> what happened was, as the evangelist laid his hand on him, he fell down. And he's a man that did not believe in the falling down either. He'll never go to the altar to be a catcher. He just... He discounted that, he discounted tongues, he discounted these things. I don't know who gave him the right to, but he chose to. And he opened his eyes and realized he was staring at the roof, the ceiling. And he wondered how that happened, because he knew he was standing for prayer, and now he's watching the ceiling. He didn't even know when he fell, he didn't know anything. So he figured he must have passed out. And as he was getting up to say something, God took control of his language. God doesn't often do that, but he did. And my brother was a changed man. One of his famous words to me was, my brother, you are wrong. And he's the only person who could have said wrong that would penetrate me. But after that experience, he never said I was wrong about anything. Maybe even I was wrong. His whole spirit of judgmental behavior was gone. He understood what it was like to be slain in the spirit. He understood what it was like to receive the gifts of tongues he understood sanctification because he had an experience. Yes. And God almost forced it on him. And I don't understand why God is God and he does things the way he wants. But he doesn't always force things on us. Yes. Maybe deep in his heart he was longing for it and he got it. I don't know. 
But I'm here to tell you this morning that sanctification is a second work of grace that's given at the same time as salvation, but you have to desire it. You have to want to go deeper with the Lord or you will stay fixed in the position of being saved. Some of us just want salvation so we could go to heaven. We'll go through the motions of water baptism. We'll do these simple things because we want to go to heaven. But Christ didn't die just for us to go to heaven. He died so that we can be the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the vibrant, energized body of Christ reaching the lost at all costs. And you'll never be able to do it unless you're sanctified. And you'll never experience it unless you desire it. That's why I believe deep in my brother's heart he desired it. God had to force it on him because he was a tough nut. Stubborn. And after that, he was a different very different man, very forgiven, very easy to get along with, never more saying you are wrong. He wasn't qualified to judge. He allowed God to be God in his life because he had something new, a different dimension of Christianity. The second question they asked, will God do it all within the believer's lifetime? Would God do all that he needs to do within the believer's lifetime? Would God do all? And after the debate was concluded again, the answer was yes, God will do all in the believer's lifetime. But it's determined by the believer's natural ability or desire. If the believer has no participation in the process, God has done his part, and we deny ourselves all the benefits that can be derived. But it's done in our lifetime. Far too many Christians will never become disciples of Christ. Their lives will never be trans... They they don't know what is forgiveness. They don't know how to let things go. If they can't get it their way, you know, the man's still drinking rum, I don't want nothing to do with he. Or the woman's still cussing bad words, I don't want nothing to do with she. E.M. Gary had a saying, many of you too young to know him, but he said, you'll never catch flies with vinegar. If you want to correct everybody and teach everybody and you're not qualified to do it in God's way, you'll only drive them away, the vinegar. But if you're loving and forgiving and like last Sunday's message, the agape is flowing into you, that you're, it gives you the capacity to forgive. That can only happen when you are sanctified. Yes. Sanctification. You may have your moments of struggle. Yes. Sometimes it takes you a day or two to get through it, to be able to forgive, let it go. Sometimes it's an instant. But unless you are at that place, question whether you are sanctified or not, because Jesus forgave everybody. The last words on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And if we can't forgive, then how do you expect his forgiveness to flow into us? The Dead Sea, nothing lives there. 
Because everything is flowing into the Dead Sea. Nothing flows out. So nothing could live there. And if we as Christians receive the gift of salvation and we only let things flow in and flow in and flow in and nothing flowing out, we will be stagnated and dead. It is not forced upon, nor does it exclude the believer's participation. I want to look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being, the Apostle Paul is right in the church at Philippi. Yes, thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Oh, with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. This one, listen to it very carefully. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Our participation brings about a process of sanctification. That process never stops until we die, but we're in Christ. But Christ's empowerment within us makes it possible to continue on and continue on in this sanctified lifestyle. Are you getting it, my friends? Dr. Billy Graham, when he preached in Toronto shortly before the end of his tenure, as an old man, he was saying, I am still working on me. I still have things that have not been worked out. The Apostle Paul put it this way, I have not yet apprehended that for which I was apprehended. In short, the Christian who has been sanctified, even though it's a complete work of sanctification, continues in a progressive work of sanctified living. Because we make mistakes, we drop the ball, there's a real enemy always trying to trick us and tie us up, and we continue to work out our salvation. And that's what these fellows are saying. And that's what I believe. Would God do all without the believer's activity? That's the third question. Will God do all without the believer's activity? Conclusion. By the gracious work of Christ, by the Spirit within us, purifying himself, or purifying us, by God's gracious Spirit within us, united with the Spirit that's within us, we are purifying ourselves. So God will not do it without the believer's activity. It's all done. His part is complete. There's no, but our part must be with God's help. We can't do it on our own. God is prepared to assist us. Peter wrote this in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, we have been given everything pertaining to godly life, Zoe life. But add to your faith. Why do we have to add to our faith? If we saved, we saved. No, no. Add to your faith. The process of sanctification is a daily addition process. But it's not just ourselves. What we, what we will discover is that as we add to ourselves, we start adding to people around us. I gave a guy a ride home. Yesterday, when I was leaving the building to go home. And as he got in the car, he says, well, praise God. I said, whoa, I'm glad you know about him. Tell me everything you know about him. 
He said, well, I know that God is in God. I mean, that's it. I said, well, so where do you go to church now? In a nice, quiet voice. He said, oh, well, you know, um, uh, 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 sometimes let's go by the Methodist. But he said, I'll go anywhere. Maybe he is saved, I don't know. I'm not the judge of that. But what a great denial, because if all of this is available to him, and he has never acquired it, never acquired it, never done anything about it, the greatest gift to mankind is salvation. And for salvation to be beneficial, there must be sanctification. But most of us just deny ourselves of the benefits of it. So what we do is we cry out to God, we talk to friends, because friends will help us quicker than God. Hmm? Peter says, no, no sorry, John, in, in the Revelator, John says, how can you say you love God if you do not love your neighbor whom you could see? How can you say you love God that you cannot see when you don't love your neighbor whom you could see? Well, you know, my neighbor fret me, so I don't have nothing to do with them again. Maybe so. But if you start praying, God might give you an open door. Hmm? Hmm? How can a young woman possibly love a father who has molested her? Hmm? If you start praying, God might show you how. Because in sanctification, we're able to do what Jesus did. But in ourselves, we're just not able. We might try. We might try very hard, but we lose our cool and we mess it up. The spirit within purifies us. John 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Listen to what he said. Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Uh, Jesus was like most of us pastors, and that kind of man come to us trying to ask us questions. We might say, what do he, man, that man, dismiss him, but not so with Jesus. This man came to Jesus by night. You, it's the first thing you might ask is, so, so you're ashamed to come and see me in the day? Why well, you come by me in the night? But not so, Jesus, not so. And he said to him, to, to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one could do the signs that you do unless God is with you, with him, sorry. Here's what Jesus answered and said to him, and that's what I want to focus on. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again. That's a, that's a loaded word, you know. Evangelicals use it quite liberally. But unless you're saved and sanctified, unless salvation is received as a gift from God, and sanctification is pursued, as a gift to serve God, you'll not see the kingdom of God. What you will see is men as trees. What you will see is a form of Christianity with no demonstration of power because the first power begins to change my life. Just recently I've been pleading with God about this daily. 
There was a time in my life when God allowed me to be part of so many miracles and lately nothing. I said, well, where have I gone wrong or is it? But God is God and he decides when and where and who. Maybe he's waiting on some young people who, was, or who are in the age group that I was in. Some vibrant people who are sanctified and willing to serve, to step out and start to call on God for healing of the sick and call on God for deliverance of the demons and to call on God for whatever it is that they're confronted with. And maybe we're just too reluctant to take that role seriously. Then we never see the kingdom of God. What we see is church. What we see is people in church that could easily judge them and what they're wearing and what they do and what they didn't do and how they, what they say to me and what they do. We need to live a sanctified life. We need to live a sanctified life. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it is not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, everyone who have this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. That's sanctification. How then must we attain sanctification? This question is answered for us in many passages. Let's take an easy one. Every one of us, most every one of us, know Romans. We've been studying the book of Romans. We haven't got to verse 12, chapter 12 yet because according to Brother Andy, it's so sweet, we can't go too fast. We have to get as much as we can from it. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, Apostle Paul, I beseech you, I plead with you, I beg you, I implore you, not me, the Apostle Paul, brethren, by the mercies of God, not by your own strength, but by the mercies of God. God had made it available that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How are you going to prove it? By operating in that dimension. And then God responds. And you see right before you the things that make your heart leap. And you know you couldn't do that. And you give God thanks because he's using you. If you don't have that experience, your Christianity will remain dusty. It will remain boring. But if ever you have one of those experiences, you'll be zealous for more. You'll see more of you, more of you, of things I've had my fill but yet I hunger still for more of you. That's the church 
that's sanctified. That's our cry. Step one. Make yourself available by the mercies of God. Not in your strength, but by the mercies of God. And present your bodies. He's going to use you, but you can't go without your body. You can't be so heavenly minded that you know earthly good. You have to use your body because he's in your body. He's with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you to the end of the age. Why then we find it so difficult? There must be a constant removing of the minds. Colossians 1, verses 22 and 23. And you, who once were alien, alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which, is in, which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under the heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Not Adrian, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, is letting us know that holiness, being separated and set apart, is sanctification, being set apart and holy for service in the kingdom of God. And you say, well, Pastor, you know, I just try, but I'm not able because I'm a little bit, you know, a little bit reserved. The first day I was called upon to stand up in front of the congregation, my knees were knocking. But I made the best mistake I could ever have made and asked the Lord, whatever, I promised him, whatever, Lord, they ask of me, I say, I've served the devil with the best years of my life, and whatever is remaining is yours. Anything they ask of me, in your name or for your service, I'm doing it to the best of my ability. So help me, because I will need all the help I could get. And they called me to teach a Sunday school class, green as grass. They put the book in my hand. I couldn't even read the handwriting. And I stood up there trembling all over, my voice and all shaking. But I promised the Lord. And by the end of the class, I found that I was able to share something of value that I myself didn't know before. Yes. I'm telling you, fear will cripple you so you'll never become a sanctified child of God. Fear and doubt are confusions of the enemy. But faith, when we stand in faith, saying, I know that my God is with me, whatever it takes, you have me, I give it all to you. Give it all to Jesus. Give it all to Jesus. Why must we be sanctified? So how do we do it? This is how we do it. There's so many more. I could read at least 25 or 30 texts that talks about how, how, what, what, what we need to be doing. It's all through the New Testament. But why do we need to be sanctified? Why must we be sanctified? This takes back to our text. 
I'm going to read a little more of the text. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being, being sanctified. It's a process that never ends. But it'll never begin unless you want to be. It's waiting for you. It's waiting for you. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds, I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. No. Where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. You no longer have to work things in your flesh to please God. But you look to God to help you to work that you might be a part of his kingdom's work. Not so that people could look at you and make comments about how spiritual you are and how much Bible you know and forget all that fluff and concentrate on one thing. Lord, I really want to be one of yours. I really want to be sanctified and set apart to be a disciple of Christ, to walk in those footsteps where men will say things to you and people will do things to you and you remain unmoved, unscathed. Because the pastor didn't show up, you're so disappointed, but Jesus is there. Amen. Pastor can't come, but Jesus is there. He's with you. There's a song that goes, All the way. Jesus is with me, night and day, all the way. Get hold of it. That's why we need to be sanctified, because God's grace is available to all who will receive it. However, we need to be involved. Many Christians have not grown into sanctification because they can't. You cannot be sanctified and be stubborn unless your stubbornness is to get what God has for you. Your, your stubbornness to hold on in spite of all the challenges to hold on If you're obstinate and have an attitude that's not acceptable to God and you're determined to let it stay with you, well, all you know is always speak my mind. Get out of here, no sanctification, because God doesn't want you to speak your mind. He wants you to renew your mind. Renew your mind daily. And some people could never grow into sanctification because they just can't. They block themselves out. They lock themselves out. They want to remain how they are. They want salvation, but leave me alone. Don't touch me. Don't bother me. I am my own man. I am my own woman, and leave me alone. I can prove myself. Hello? You'll have no part of God's glory. You'll have no part of serving God. We have to be able to set it down and say, Lord, just as... I am without one plea. Come to that place and give your heart wholly and totally to Christ. Simply become a disciple of Christ. 
If you're too focused on your own desires, your own pleasures of this world, and you figure you wouldn't give this up and that up. When I first became a Christian, I could tell you I was an alcoholic. And one of the things I told my wife is I said, no more drinking. But you know, when we go out for dinner and, you know, we order our wine with the dinner and so on. Well, God knocked that out of my skin so fast I didn't even know when. I took all of the stuff and I poured it on the kitchen sink. I had a choice to live or die. You put me in that place where I had a choice to live or die, and I said, Lord, I choose life. And I got rid of the poison. If you want to hold on to things of the world, you cannot focus. He wants your total, absolute focus on the desires to serve. Let's examine ourselves. Would you stand with me? Are you truly ready this morning to serve the Lord with all of your heart and soul and strength? If so, pure.